today. Thank you. Uh, my name is Andrea Mafitano, and I'm the Dean of the College of Osteopathic Medicine. It's my pleasure to welcome you tonight to the 23rd annual Dr. William G. Anderson Lecture Series, Slavery to Freedom and American Odyssey. Um, before we get started, I think we'd like to take a minute to remember our students that we lost, uh, Ariel, Brian, and Alexandria, um, the five that are still recovering, uh, their families, their friends, what they're going through, what they will be going through, what they've been through. Um, if we could just take a moment of silence. Thank you for that. Um, I'd like to begin uh, by extending our gratitude to the numerous sponsors who have helped make this year's series and many of the past series possible. Um, as, you, as you can see on the, the slides and in the brochures or on our website, uh, many MSU colleges and units, uh, sponsors from, from the community uh, and corporate sponsors all have come together in a collaborative fashion uh, to assist us in this event for today, as well as the many years we've done this. Um, we hope you make it a point to acknowledge them uh, for helping us bring our thought-provoking speakers to East Lansing year after year. And I'd like to ask you just a round of applause for all of our sponsors. Thank you again. Um, the dialogues that occur as a part of this series foster important historical and cultural reflections about the contributions of African Americans in this country. As many of you know, Dr. William G. Anderson led our college in establishing this lecture series, which was named in his honor in 2014. Dr. Anderson, his wife Norma, Martin Luther King Jr., and Ralph Abernathy were integral to the Albany movement, one of the most important civil rights struggles in the United States. We're indebted to Dr. Anderson for his sacrifices during that movement and as a trailblazer in the osteopathic and medical professions and for his efforts and passion to make the Slavery to Freedom series what it is today. Dr. Anderson is in the house. Please. Okay. Neither rain nor sleet will stop that man. Thanks, Dr. Anderson. Following in his legacy, I also want to highlight our Associate Dean for Diversity and Campus Inclusion, Dr. Marita Gilbert. Dr. Gilbert and her team are working tirelessly to assist not only the MSU College of Osteopathic Medicine, but the greater university in becoming places of inclusive excellence. And we thank her for those ongoing efforts. And I'm going to turn it over and get out of her way. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Well, hello. You're still working on it. You're still working on it. Week three. Week three. Hello and welcome. This is our last night of the 2023 William G. Anderson Lecture Series, Slavery to Freedom and American Odyssey. So we've already had some recognitions. Um, I wanna pause for a couple more acknowledgements as we begin our program tonight. So I'm gonna invite Dr. Red Dog Sina, Associate Professor of Osteopathic Manipulative Medicine and Vice Chair of our college's DEI Committee. I'm gonna ask him to come to the stage to read our land acknowledgement, followed by music performance student, Phoenix Miranda, who will sing again for us, lift every voice and sing. And then we're gonna have some moments of reflection um, by our MSU board chair, Rima Vassar. So I may have been, I may have been born in the baby boom, but I have to read off of my phone. Ani, we'll try that again, Ani. 
we collectively acknowledge that Michigan State University occupies the ancestral, traditional, and contemporary lands of the Anishinaabeg people. The Three Fires Confeder Confederacy of Ojibwe, Odawa, and Potawatomi. In particular, the, the university resides on land ceded in the 1819 Treaty of Saginaw. We recognize, support, and advocate for the sovereignty of Michigan's 12 federally recognized Indian nations, for historic indigenous communities in Michigan, for indigenous individuals and communities who live here now, and for those who were forcibly removed from their homelands. By offering this land acknowledgement, we affirm indigenous sovereignty and will work to hold Michigan State University more accountable to the needs of American Indian and indigenous peoples. The history of American Indian people, the history of indigenous people is also the history of African American people. And statements like this are a really good start, but we have to keep going. Thank you. Lift every voice and sing till earth and heaven ring, ring with the harmonies of liberty. Let our rejoicing rise high as the listening skies. Let it resound loud as the rolling sea. Sing a song full of the faith that the dark past has taught us. Sing a song full of the hope that the present has brought us. Facing the rising sun of our new day begun, let us march on till victory is won. Good evening. Oh, there you warmed them up. You warmed them up. I want to um, thank you, Soror, Dr. Marita Gilbert, for your work. Right. Um, this is important, right? And I, I, the dean took most of my thunder, and so I, I can skip past a, a, a big portion of my my talk and just center you um, and your commitment to uh, diversity equity and inclusion, but inclusion that is excellent, right? Not just regular, oh, let's talk about it, but not be about it inclusion, but real inclusion. And so um, one that, that changes the space so that folks can feel comfortable, that's the inclusion that you're talking about. Not that we have to ingratiate and, and assimilate and acculturate, but the, the space is made better because of the diversity there. That's the inclusion that you give. And I just wanna, I really wanna thank you and I wanna give us all a hand for her in her work. I wanna honor uh, Dr. Anderson for your legacy and your hard work. 
I appreciate even being here under the auspices of your legacy. Um, I feel honored to be here and I appreciate you. And I just wanna say that this is the annual opportunity to, to consider the totality. Can I put this down? Yeah. Thank you. Okay, I don't wanna to touch other people's stuff, you know. Okay, all right, y'all can fix it. Okay. okay. This is an annual opportunity to consider the totality of our human condition and our experiences for Black Americans. And when I say the totality of our human condition and I say Black Americans, it's as the speaker just said, the Black experience is the American experience, is the total human experience. And so the totality of our human condition, if you want to know how we're doing, the litmus test, the metric is the Black condition. So how are we doing? I'm an educator, was a K-12 educator for most of my life um, in higher ed since 2005. Got several degrees in education, right? Have uh, thought about education, eat, sleep, breathe, education, because I, I see it as the most powerful, most potent place of change. If there's a disease, the cure, the elixir is education. And so education being the most potent mediator in people's lives, I'm always wanting it to change. I want it to change because I want the world to change. Everyone has to go through schools, some kind of schooling experience. Everyone has to go through, right? So if we want an intervention, if we wanna see more justice, we wanna see more equity, if we want people to feel included, that place to start is schools. Sure, I can see black folks continue to win despite systems persistently detrimental to our well-being. Too many of us are not thriving though. Some of us are left behind because schools are not, are, are sometimes most powerful sites of oppression um, that thwart our joy, stifle our yeah. social skills, still our voices, deny our histories, impede our intellectual acumen, curtail our creativity, police our bodies, prepare our peonage, disrupt our interdependence, obstruct our communal comeuppance. We need a different experience. We deserve schools that are better meant to, and they are meant to see us all aligned with our demonstrated undeniable potency and possibilities. The same potency and possibilities that we saw robbed of three of our Spartans last week. Immediately I thought, okay, one of the parents having a child myself and having my child shelter in place as well. But then two, how, how do you send your baby to school? And they come back and you bury them. How do we do this? There's something fundamentally wrong with our world. If you can send your baby for an education and we know anyone, anyone who knows anybody black knows that black folks think that the only way to success is education. It's drilled. You can't, you, I'd have never met a black mama who didn't say you, the, the key to success is education. So she sent her baby here and her baby didn't make it. Again, if you're thinking about what is wrong, you have to look at the black condition. She lost her baby. I, I, I couldn't even talk to her afterwards because she was on the phone with the people who were going to help her or donate the organs of her daughter. I had to talk to her sister, who was lovely, gracious, kind. The mother was trying to get her, her daughter's organs donated. Not that same woman. Just let this sit with you. No. Ariel Anderson, Ariel. Brian, Frazier, Alexandra, Alexandria, Werner. They came to school. They came to school. For potency and possibility. At her funeral, At I, her gave three funeral I gave three scriptures. I gave them three scriptures. We can stand and shout the joy comes. Psalms 35. Nehemiah tells us that the joy of the Lord is our strength. And so until the morning, 
We need to collectively mourn, cry out, hold each other. The community, the village is what will keep us through this loss and take us to this loss. Thessalonians says, therefore, encourage one another and build each other up as you are today. Today, we're in a space to acknowledge the loss of potency and possibility in our students. I just want to take another moment of silence. I'll end with this. Encourage one another to do what's right for all of us. Black folks struggle for civil rights, full humanity, equitable access and opportunity are exemplars for other folks interested in justice and improving the human condition. We get studied everywhere. This, this civil rights movement gets studied across the world. If you wanna learn how to create justice, look at the civil rights struggle. Invariably, when Black people have secured any gain, everyone else has benefited each single time, right? What we do for Black students when they succeed becomes best practice for everyone else. If we resolve to do what's necessary to ensure that Black students can thrive in our schools, every other student will win. I promise you. And I want us all to win. Thank you. Okay, y'all, they're giving me some instructions. Hang on, Miss Terry, one second. Hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on. So I know, um, listen, you all, when I, I saw some of you all coming in, some of you greeted me, hugged me, um, shook my hand, and there is a heaviness in this room. There is a heaviness on our campus, and, and I understand that. Um, I will admit to you this week, I've been struggling with the own, my own feeling of heaviness. I'm also here to tell you, some of you know, I'm from a place with a particular tradition of mourning. I'm from New Orleans, the home of the second line tradition. So mourning for us is communal. I thank you, Dr. Vassar, for the solemnity of that moment. So in New Orleans, we have what we call the dirge, right? And it holds space for people to process and, and really feel the pain of whatever tragedy we've had. We have the dirge, right? And then the tempo picks up, not because the feeling necessarily has changed, but it's the reminder y'all as the elders used to say that trouble don't last always. So I feel your heaviness, okay? But I'm gonna also tell you that the ancestors have given us everything that we need. And so we are celebrating black histories, black histories and black futures. We are gonna lean into this, this spirit of turning our morning into dancing. That's what we're gonna do right now. Last, last week, last two weeks ago, I asked y'all to give me one moment, one full minute of black joy. Y'all remember that? Yeah, 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 yeah. This is your this your 60 second countdown because we are gonna turn our morning into dancing. I'm gonna tell y'all one more thing about our tradition of morning. When we dance, it doesn't mean we don't cry. We often do it at the same time because we hold both feelings at the same time. We are about to turn our mourning into dancing. That's our tradition in our community. Y'all ready? Okay, y'all ready to stand up? Y'all ready to shake some of this off? Okay. I'm gonna need some of my girls to come help me. Miss Terry, you ready? All right, let's go. Y'all ready? Let's do it. She thinks she's ready. And while we're doing this, I'm gonna get somebody to get our tech back up online. <laughs> I don't know what to do. Okay.
also for those of you that are zooming in, you will not hear the audio that is in this room because I didn't write these songs. So um, you all can find your own song and bop on your own, but we're going to turn up and then we'll get right back to you. Okay. All right. I don't know what to do. Oh, now see. They want to make me sing a hymn or something. Uh -huh. What do you want to drink? Um, spilled stuff on Dr. Me. Rima asked me, she said, can you sing? I said, y'all don't want him. Y'all ready? Um, I was going to show that sparkling juice. I, I'll get that for both of us. It's too complicated. It's living right beside me. I won't forget it. I really love you. You just don't know. I want to be so proud. Now we have to try I want to I want to I want to make so upright. I want to make so I want to yeah, give thanks. Give thanks. Give thanks. Give thanks. All right. Some of y'all gonna have to practice this joy situation. It's okay. By next year, y'all gonna have it. All right. Um, is Barbara in here? Okay. So, Dr. Vassar. I'm gonna give you a minute to catch your breath. I'm gonna catch mine. <laughs> Again, um, this series celebrates black histories and histories and black futures. We want to honor you as the first. We wanna honor Dr. Vassar as the first. We wanna honor Dr. Vassar as the first. So thank you to Dr. Vassar. Um, we don't quite have the um, tech backup, but Rima, who is who has been a supporter, you are um, Black History and you are MSU History. So we have a gift for you. Yes, I have no idea where it is, but <laughs> yes. Uh, but I wanted to have that moment just to celebrate you. This is it, actually. Magic. Yes, with the heels. So um, I'll tell you what it is. So we had Darnell Kendrick um, designed a portrait for the series this year, and we've had it on display the rest of the weeks of the series. And your gift is a print, but you are, it's signed and numbered and you are print one <laughs> for being first. <laughs> all right, y'all. We have kept Dr. Rabowski waiting for all of my shenanigans. So I wanna thank everybody, our Dean, Dr. Cena, Phoenix, always. Thank you. 
Um, all of you who are here with us this evening, physically, virtually, thank you for joining us tonight. Um, so a few items of housekeeping, as you were walking in, the usher, some of our volunteers handed you some cue cards so that you can um, write questions throughout Dr. Rabowski's talk, okay? So if you don't have a cue card, you can wave and someone will walk down the aisle to give you a question. If you are online, you can place your questions in the Q&A box. And we have a volunteer who will give me your questions as well at the end of the presentation and we will share those. All right, so tonight we welcome Dr. Freeman Rabowski, who I hope we have not scared away. <laughs> Dr. Rabowski is an educator, a scientist, and a researcher. He's most recently served as president of the University of Maryland, Baltimore County, from 1992 to 2022. As a researcher, his work and publications focus on science and math education, with special emphasis on increasing participation and performance of students of historically excluded and underrepresented populations. Among his many accomplishments, Dr. Rabowski chaired the National Academies Committee that produced the 2011 report expanding underrepresented, underrepresented minority participation, America's science and technology talent at the crossroads. In 2012, Former President Obama named him to chair the President's Advisory Commission on Educational Excellence for African Americans. In 2022, Dr. Abowski was elected to the National Academy of Engineering for development of a national education model for students from diverse backgrounds to excel in engineering and science. The same year, the Howard Hughes Medical Institute, HHMI, pledged $1.5 billion with a B dollars to support early career scientists and increase diversity in STEM through its new initiative, the Freeman Robowski Scholars Program. <laughs> Please join me in welcoming someone who's been my hero, Dr. Freeman Robowski. Thank you very much. Dr. Gilbert used her connections to me to get me working all day long, and it's been a, a great day. It really has. Dr. Beauchamp and others with whom I worked this morning, Good Henry Ford. I, I, before I begin, I want to acknowledge two people who have been for me the essence of the best of Michigan State. And they were here. I hope they're still here. And I want them to stand, George and Ida, Professors Emeriti, from here. Would you all please stand? Stockman, Dr. Stockman, would you all please stand? They have been here for years and years, have now retired. And they've always been. George has been to my campus, for example. Dr. Stockman was the best student of my relative ever from Jackson State in Mississippi, and both now retired professors. But they represent the best of America on this day and give them one more round of applause, would you? Yes. And their daughter who grew up in, on this campus, I'm sure went on to Harvard and New York Times editorial writer now, Farrah, it's just an amazing story. And Dr. Anderson, I, I wanna say again, thank you. Dr. Anderson is a graduate of my parents' alma mater of Alabama State. My parents met there in the thirties and from 1949. Very nice, very, very nice. Um, William, Carlos Williams once said that it's difficult to find news in poetry, and yet men die miserably every day because of a lack of what's found there. And so I begin with words from our beloved and now late Sister Maya Angelou, who looked into the face of America at the time of the installation of another president and said, lift up your eyes upon this day breaking for you, give birth again to the dream. Women, children, men, take it, this dream, into the palms of your hands, mold it into the image of your most public self, sculpt it into the shape of your most private need. Here on the pulse of this new day, you may have the grace to look up and out and into your sister's eyes and into your brother's face and say simply, very simply with hope, good morning. Hello, Michigan State University. A round of applause for poetry. For poetry, please, a round of applause. 
It is. I had read about your new chair of the board, Dr. Vassa, and Dr. Gilbert's been telling me about in Michigan State. I begin with a story. You know, I, I am from um, Baltimore, which is the Upper South, the Upper South. One day we think like Philadelphia, the next day like Richmond. It's been that way since the Civil War. But some of us, Ida, are from uh, Brother Stanley, uh, Brother, I believe in uh, Brother Anderson, we're from the Deep South, Deep South. When you think Georgia, Mississippi, Alabama, Louisiana, Marie, right? And we Southerners love stories. Everybody loves stories, but we Southerners can weave a story. We like that. How many of you are old enough to remember Steel Magnolias with Dolly Parton? Remember, at some point, somebody's in the beauty parlor and they're, they're clearly lying. And all the cosmetologists are looking at each other going, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And as the person leaves, Dolly says, there's a story there. Each of us has a story, every race, every gender, each of us. And it's, it will be our stories that shape not only who we are today, but who we will be in the future. And my essential theme here, my relative who taught, Dr. Stockman, taught English. And you remember the English teachers always said, you tell people what you're going to tell them, then you tell them, then you tell them what you told them, right? And my point is that the way we think about ourselves, the language that we use, the way we interact with each other will be so important. We become like the things we love. If we love to read, we enjoy reading, we become quite literate, right? Um, if we enjoy thinking about ideas, we become great thinkers. And so I'm telling the story now as a storyteller, I'm sitting, in church, and it's a story different from the one I normally tell. I'm sitting in church, and all of a sudden, someone goes to our minister and says something, and the minister stops everything. And this was literally 60 years ago, 60 years ago in September of 1963. I'm, I was just turning 13. And he said, please remain calm. 16th Street Baptist Church, which was our sister church, has just been bombed. And I start with this story for obvious reasons. That as I've, as I've told people over the past few weeks, I'm coming to Michigan State since your tragedy. Everybody has said, please let them know we're all praying for Michigan State University. You've handled yourselves with such dignity in a time of tragedy. And it came to me as I thought about joy in the morning to tell this story of tragedy. And I'll never forget, everybody was in a daze. Even the pastor, he said, 16th Street has just been bombed. And you heard that gasp. Now, our members of our church were relatives. They were the parents or the children of people at 16th Street. Their sisters and brothers, our cousins, and one was at 6th Avenue and 16th Street South. Our church, theirs was 6th Avenue and 16th Street North, built by two black men in the 18, late 19th century. The two big middle-class churches. And all of a sudden, you all had Angela Davis here recently. Angela's mother taught me, and my mother taught her and her sister. So this small middle-class black community in Birmingham. And he told us to leave calmly. He kept us calm. And adults, the men, were driving over to the church. The others, the children, were to go home because we didn't know whether our church was about to be bombed. We didn't know what was going to happen. And all that day, we kept getting the news about people being found. And then we started hearing about not seeing certain people looking for some little girls. And we talk about, say, their names. And those names have been with me for 60 years, Addie and Carol and Denise and Cynthia. They could not find them. And one of the little girls, they were my family friends. One was in my class, Cynthia. And one of the girls' father had given her a ring that morning. And they found a little hand with a ring. Children, little girls, 
dressed in white in the bathroom, in the restroom there at the church before service began after Sunday school, primping as little girls can do, not knowing there was a bum behind the commode. And they were blown up. And I remember sitting in that church within a week representing my school as I looked at three little coffins. Three of the families had agreed of the four to be funeralized together. And Dr. King said, and it's hard to talk about, but I do it because I think about the parents of the MSU students and the, the, all of the students here and all of it. I do it because it is to say we never forget the tragedies. And yet, joy can come. He said, to those parents. Life is as hard as steel. And in the final analysis, all we have is each other, our faith and each other. Now back for it. All of that came because just a few months before that, I'm sitting in that same church in the back of the room, not wanting to be there, little kid in the middle of the room, being placated with the two things I love most, math and eating. So I was getting smarter and fatter all the time. And in the South, they like those cheeks. You know what I'm talking about. And I'm doing my little algebra. And the man at the lectern says, if the children participate in this peaceful protest, all of America will understand that even our young people know the difference between right and wrong. And our children can get a better education. We had some wonderful teachers, Black, but without the resources. And using hand-me-down books, not a pretty picture, not at all. And not able to bring new books into some schools because they'd be considered not nice for some kids to have new books and everybody else to have the old books from the white schools, raggedy books with brown paper bags around them. And I wanted to see what it would be like to be in class with white kids, only because all of my life I'd been told that they were smarter. And to me, Dr. Anderson, smart meant you were willing to work hard and to be intellectually curious and to give it everything you have. And I was ready to do that. I love the math. I got goosebumps doing math. I got kicked for math. The teacher would say, here are the 10 problems. And I'd say, give us 10 more, teacher. And the whole class would go, shut up, Freeman. Shut up. I got kicked for math all the time. I loved it. So that story is important because you see, when he said he wanted us to march, Dr. King, Dr. Martin Luther King, who is that man? Dr. Martin at the lectern. And he said, I want the children to be involved in this peaceful protest. And I went home and I said, I, I've got to go. I've got to go. He wants us to go. And what did my parents say? Absolutely not. They said, you're 12. You're too out of you. It's not that we don't trust you. We don't trust the people who will be over you because if you march, you're going to jail. So Dr. Anderson said, I went to jail. That next day, I followed and I went to jail. It was a horrible experience, horrific, treated like slaves, like animals, not enough restrooms, too many children in the same little space, no beds on the floor for a week. But in the middle of the week, Dr. King came in and he looked, uh, we were looking out the jailhouse and all our parents, and he said, what you do this day, children, will have an impact on children who've not yet been born. And we sense somehow the profundity. The kids are crying. They want to get out. And our parents are trying to be strong for us. And the only thought I had was, what will happen to us? It was 1963. That was May. All of a sudden, we made a little progress after we got out of jail. And Birmingham began to open up. I told this story. I was writing it when I was chairing the Obama Commission. And anything I wrote at the time had to be approved by um, the White House when it was on these kinds of sensitive topics. And I sent it over and I had said, we must tell our story because most people don't know the stories. And uh, I said something about the percent of people who were not born yet. And the White House staff, brilliant young people, really young people in their thirties, they scratched at all of that. And I said, well, why did you, they said, who, ca who cares about whether somebody was born or not, right? Now, let me show you something. I, raise your hand if you were already in the world in 1963. Let me see who you are. Oh, you all look good. You really do. 
you look good. This is very unusual audience. This is an audience that believes in black history because do you know 70% of Americans were not in the world? Raise your hands if you were not in the world in 1963. You see what I mean? It's disgusting, perfectly disgusting. I want you to know that. <laughs> but 70% of Americans had not been born in 1963. And so when they read things in a history book, reading about the civil rights movement is like reading about the Civil War. If you're not there, it's just something you see on paper. And the only way I could get these young people to appreciate what I was saying was I said, how many of you were around when 9-11 occurred? And all of us said, oh, yeah. I said, you remember that feeling you had, that first reaction when you saw that tower going up, blowing up, right? You know, that fear. It's the same fear that some of us had when President Kennedy was killed. When Dr. King was killed, there's a lump in your stomach that you'll always know. A child who was not in the world that can't know that same feeling. You get my point? And this is why we must tell our story, his story, her story, because we want people to know those names of those little girls are still very real to some of us. Just as those young people who were killed on this campus, tragically killed on this campus. What is my point? We must never forget that we go through these periods when we see the result of hatred, of racism, of unadulterated meanness, of mental health issues, all those. And as the chair of the board said, Dr. Vassa, the challenge we face is to think, what now? What do we do now? And this is where the civil rights movement has lessons. Now, interestingly enough, I was talking about this movement uh, to the Georgia Association of School Boards some years ago, and people were somewhat uncomfortable. And I'm, I'm accustomed to working to help people to not feel I'm trying to fight them or embarrass them. I'm simply speaking my truth. And uh, my mother, who was an English teacher, often would quote Emily Dickinson, who said, tell the truth, but tell it slant. If you tell the whole truth like that, people come out fighting you. So you plant seeds, get people to think about things rather than just giving the brutal, the whole truth immediately. And I was trying to do that. And yet I could tell people were really having a difficult time wanting to know why, why must we talk about this? Because that's where we are today. In many places, when people say, why must we talk about these times? That's all in the past. No, we are the products of our experiences. And interestingly enough, a white gentleman gets up, at the Beauchamp, you'll appreciate this, gets up and he says, I am the president of the, and he named the city in Georgia school board. I am the CEO of my company. Uh, you look at me and you think wealth, and I am wealthy. He said, but you assume that I've always been wealthy. He said, it was my childhood experience in rural Georgia and I was a sharecropper because my dad, my mama was, because my dad had died. And my mama saw the little Negro children going off to college in the early 70s. And she said, I want my children to have that. And we got a Pell Grant because that had just come out in the early 70s. And I went to college. And that led to my now being a CEO. So when he said to this audience that was 90 some percent white, when when he talks about the civil rights movement, don't you dare think it's just about blacks and women. It's about all of America. So I want you all to give the civil rights movement a round of applause for what it's done for all of us, for all of us. Now, here is the point when Dr. King talked about changing the world. Let me give you an example. And I said part of this this morning. What percent of Americans if you were there this morning, don't give the answer. What percent of Americans in the mid-60s had graduated from college? What do you all think? Take a guess. 20%, I see 7%, 10, 25. How many of you don't know? Tell me the truth. How many? Okay, all right, all right. It turns out it really was only 10%, and everything was broken into black and white. Then I always ask people, how many remember black and white TV? Oh, you all look real good. Because 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 most audiences will tell me black and white TV's always been in color. No, let me tell you how far the world has come. We got the first color TV on our street, and everybody came to look at it 
And people really thought it meant a TV where you had colored people when it said color TV. <laughs> That's how far we've come, folks. You, the idea of colors? No, nobody understood that. But at that point, everything was black and white. So what percent of Americans, uh, white Americans, had graduated from college? What do you think? If 10% overall, nice math problem, folks. What percent of white Americans? 40, 50, 25. Now, you all are better than the Henry Ford group because this morning people were too, they were risk adverse. They wouldn't even give me an answer. You all are giving answers. That's good. So I heard 40, 50, whatever. Believe it or not, it was only 11%. 11% of whites in the mid 60s had graduated from college and three to 4% of blacks, almost all in the HBCUs, except for one or two at places like this in the North. We call, you may say this is the Midwest, but to Southerners, this is the North. Anything. <laughs> it's just the north. It's either the north or the south. California is the north, not the west. It's just so it's above the mix of things. That's that southern perspective. You all know what I'm talking about. <laughs> but here, look, think about this. So only three or four percent of blacks in it, and those were the two groups everybody talked about in the '60s. All right. So think about it. Ninety percent of Americans had not seen anyone in their families graduate from college. But what had happened after that civil rights? After that period? And after that, that bombing of the church and after the, the march on Washington that summer and then, then the bombing of the church and then the killing of President Kennedy and then LBJ and then that Southerner, LBJ, the master of the Senate, could influence the South and the Civil Rights Bill of 64, the Higher Education Bill of 65, the Voting Rights Bill of 65, and that's what changed the world. That's why we began to see more people going to college. How many people, were, you've heard of the GI Bill. Who do you think fought the GI Bill when, when FDR in, in the 40s? Uh, he, uh, he said, the people who fought it said, if you allow those veterans, and they're talking about white men, if you allow those veterans into our colleges, they will become academic hobo jungles. Who do you think said that? College presidents, president of Harvard, president of Chicago. And they weren't bad people. They were products of their children, childhood experiences. And they thought college was for the very privileged, not for the average white man, not women. And not, no, no. But what happened was within the matter of two or three years, two million people, some people of color, black, some women, mainly white guys, but they went to college and it changed their lives. And we saw 2 million regular people, not privileged, going, and people realized anybody could do it. So in 1965, they had seen the veterans doing well, and that's what changed America. And so all of a sudden, people wanted their kids to go to college. Today, we have about a third of Americans who've graduated from college, only 30-some percent. Now, people, my friends of every race were supreme, and it's got to be more than that because everybody I know graduated from college. Duh. College professors know college professors. DOs, no DOs, MDs, no MDs, right? You know, plumbers who can make a good living, no plumbers. And so here is the key. This is what I want you to think about. The fact is that more families than ever want their kids to go to college. Unfortunately, families who've had some success with college, first of all, of course, they say, yeah, of course I want my kids to go to college or a spouse to go back. But people who've not had any success don't know. That's of any race. And they hear from the media, it's so expensive, or it's going to change my child, take them from my community. And so there's a fear about it. And I tell you that when um, I was talking and, and Dr. Stockman, Ida, you said to me, where are we in this country right now? What can we say? Yes, we've moved from the three or 4% Blacks up to 20 to 30% Blacks with a college degree. For Hispanics, the number is up, the fastest growing group, to 20%. Native Americans below that. Whites are only at not quite 40%. That's why overall, it's only about a third of Americans. The Asian population, early 50 some percent, but that's not all Asian groups. Pacific Islanders, it would not be. But the point I'm making is that two thirds of Americans have never seen anyone in their families graduate from a four year institution. And if they've not seen it, and then millions of Americans of all races started college, didn't graduate and have a lot of debt. And that leaves them with a bitter taste. You get my point? So that's where we are in this privileged environment at this major research university. It is important for us to think about not only the tragedies that we face when we look at even on an advantaged campus and the challenge of guns in our society, 
the challenge of, of discrimination, of racism, of people afraid of the notion of diversity. Somehow the challenge we face is to use language that helps people understand this is not about excluding any group. It's about wanting to pull people of every group in to get the benefits of an education, whether it's community college where you've got 40% of undergrads, four year institution or more. And my research has focused on what do we do in science and engineering? Because that's, it's in the STEM areas that we have the greatest paucity of people of color. Well, they're talking about um, PhDs or people in the biotech world with double A degrees. You very rarely find people of color. And this representation is so critical, whether they're talking about DOs, MDs, nurses, healthcare professions in general, or professors in universities. The fact is that it's only when you see people looking like you do, you begin to believe maybe I could do that. That there is the issue that I want us to think about, that the country and its American higher education system is still one where there are too few people of color represented in the faculties of our institutions. And that's most pronounced in STEM, although it's true in a lot of other areas also. And so my work has focused with my colleagues at UMBC on this experiment. How do we convince the country that a predominantly white university can produce large numbers of people of color, blacks and others, who can excel in biochemistry, you see, or molecular biology or computer science? And how do we make it the case that it's not just about the exception, but where we have large numbers of people, women in technology and people of color and first generation college students who can do that. And so we've studied that and worked on that for the past 30 years. And we are the leading producer of African-Americans who go on to complete PhDs in the natural sciences and engineering and number one in the production of blacks who go on to get MD PhDs. Give my colleagues a round of applause for that. And so, as I've been saying all day, look at my TED talk. It's on those four pillars of success in these STEM areas, and it's the high expectations of ourselves. It is the idea of building community. It is the notion that it takes researchers to produce researchers. And then the, the notion of being honest with ourselves in our evaluation of what's working. So the book that I'm signing tonight, The Empowered University, empowered to do what? Empowered to look in the mirror at self. And to say, we do these things well, but we have a long way to go in these areas. And that is in the production of people who go to the professoriate. It is in increasing the numbers who not only make it, but do well, who do really do well. You know, I have the privilege of teaching presidents of colleges from around the world in the Harvard program and a half of years. And I always tell them something that either makes them laugh or upsets them. And it's this, we all talk about Congress. We all complain about what Washington is not doing. And yet all the members of Congress, almost all are products of our universities. So what does it tell us that we are truly believing in the value of a liberal arts education? If we see that people come through the programs and they're not very different from the person they were when they started. And so when we look at Washington and we are concerned, we should look at ourselves as universities. What is it, what else must we do to change attitudes and hearts and to get people looking at each other? We teach students that they must win the argument, much more so than to seek the truth. I want you to think about that. Our culture is one, so that when we're in a debate, it's not about trying to hear what the other person is saying. And but it's more about how do I get ready to get them to make that point. Fred Lawrence, the head of Phi Beta Kappa says that the fundamental purpose of education is number one, to teach students to present their arguments in a coherent fashion and back the, their points up with evidence. Number two, to be willing to listen with an open mind to other points of view and look for that evidence. And number three, it's the most difficult of all, to find the common ground. In our country right now, we have language that moves people immediately to fight. And I, I give keynote addresses to the National Association of School Boards. 10 years ago, I'd be getting 
people from every state in the room. Now there are groups that have pulled out of that organization because of the split. And my students would say this, Doc, we've never been so divided as a country. And I say, but that's where you need to study your history. Because let's go back to the 60s, the 1960s or the 1860s or the 1860s. If you watch the Hamilton production, you saw, I mean, just think about it. If you know your history, we had forebears who would have duels and kill each other, right? Or Congress people who would use a cane and beat people. So it's not like we haven't been. And in the 1960s, as wonderful as Camelot and John Kennedy was, he couldn't get anything through Congress. It was, again, the Southerner who got his friends to move ahead with things. And so what is my point? That we must think about the role of universities and school systems in teaching children to think critically, to love to learn. That I talk about STEM, but the importance of the humanities at a time when chat GBT, PT, and artificial intelligence is just coming up, George, as a computing more than ever more than ever, that we will need to be able to differentiate between an intelligent being and a human being and to understand what we bring to the table in terms of humanity. So I challenge you, Michigan State, to think about the little 12-year-old kid as I sat in jail, wondering what my future would be, to think about that little kid a few months later looking at those coffins, seeing for the first time white people in my church, seeing for the first time white men of every faith there crying over the death of these little black girls. And what it taught me was something my mother had said, Freeman, they are good people of any race, that we must find ways to find that humanity in people, that we must believe that we as a country, as a society, can be better than this, that we must not be cynical, that we must grieve, yes, but that we must keep the faith, keep the hope. We must believe we can be better than this, and we can do it in very important ways in civil engagement. We can do it when we think about who do we, who, whom do we vote for? The road talks about the whole vote. Whom do we consider accountable for these situations? Because whether it's about the guns or about the laws that govern whether we can teach the truth, it will be our power in harnessing this energy that says, let's find people whose values support all children, support the truth. And most importantly, believe that we can only be as as good a society as individuals and the ability to think critically and feel for others. I challenge you to watch your thoughts. They become your words. Watch your words. They become your actions. Watch your actions. They become your habits. Watch your habits. They become your character. I tell my students, your character has everything to do with who you are and what you will do when you don't think your mother can see you. So thoughts become words, words become actions, actions become habits, habits become character. Watch your character, it becomes your destiny. Dreams and values. Michigan State, you are so impressive and you can be even better. God bless you all. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Very good. Questions? Yep. We want to get to the questions. We want to get to some questions. I try not to go on too long so I can have time for questions and discussion. Please, please. I, I, and she's got some for me right here. By the way, I, Robbie, the Nobel laureate who uh, earned the Nobel Prize in physics in the 40s, said that when he was growing up, all of his friends' mothers would ask them, what did you learn in school today? He said, not my Jewish mother. He said, my mother would say, Izzy, did you ask a good question today? And the practice of encouraging his curiosity made him the thinker. We need an environment in which good questions are put forth. Okay, so let's go. Hi. 
Hi, um, I'm Megan, and Hi, Megan. I am going to be reading some of the questions. Okay. Uh, so Megan, are you a student? I am a student, yes. Uh -huh. I am a second year DO PhD student. Give her a round of applause for that. Uh -huh. Thank you, Megan. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for this talk, by the way. Um, so the first question comes from someone who works in college admissions uh -huh. and would like your insight in how we can use data to improve matriculation, especially with BIPOC students. Yes. Do you have suggestions, especially for STEM students? Yes. Excellent. Excellent. I, I think it's very important that we look at the academic preparation of students, that we put testing in perspective. It is a part of the of the answer. It is not the full answer. It really is not. Uh, I know people who had perfect MCAT scores and they would never be my doctor because I'm still working on, on, their, on their attitudes <laughs> and their values, all right? Um, but but we can say, when, when people say to me, tests shouldn't matter at all, I say this and it surprises me. First of all, I wrote questions for the math SAT for a long time and AP questions. I say this, I'm on the operating table and the doctor comes in and I asked the doctor, did you pass the test, the, the board? No, but I like people. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Am I going to let that person operate on me? So in other words, um, I, I don't think that testing of the traditional measures are um, sufficient, but they are necessary, but within ranges. I've seen some students at this level and some at this one, and these can other factors. It's the holistic approach. And, and I like saying it's the fire in the belly, but a minimum level of scoring, and whether it's about the science background or reading skills, you've got to have the basic fundamentals, right? And then you go from there. You go from there. The, uh, the most privileged people have had sometimes amazing test preparation, and others may not, you see. But you need to know the student can read and think well. And we need opportunities for people to learn how to do well on those tests. We need the test preparation. Not be, and people say, oh, you don't want to, you're teaching to the test. No, you're only teaching to the test if you're given the same problems. But if I have several concepts that I'm trying to understand, whether the person understands those concepts, then I, and I have a sampling of the problems and I teach them how to solve them, then that person can do them. They can, because everything is about word problems. Reading is at the heart of admissions, should be. Because we don't, we don't express problems in numbers. It's always about the reading skills. This is why the genius of the and versus tyranny of the are. It's not reading or math. It's both. And that's from Jim Collins. I don't plagiarize. That's his thing. Genius of the and versus tyranny of the are. So it's, it's looking at the, the academic preparation and getting to know the student and the student's strengths and needs and really highlighting that strengths-based approach. Somebody in... Dr. Anderson, you were saying that. It's not where you start. It's how far you've come. It's an excellent point because two people can be like this, but one can come from here. So you know there's a kind of momentum, right? And we want people to know if you made it this far with your background, you can do anything. Very important. I remember speaking at a very prestigious prep school in New England. And they had, and then I was speaking at an Ivy where many of them go. And I was talking to the kids. And those whose grandfathers had gone to that Ivy were very proud to tell me about their prep school experience. The kids who were from the, the public schools said it from New York and places, but they were embarrassed because they were not from prestige. And I took the time to shock them all. And I said, you're from this school in New York and you're here now. You must be really impressive, really impressive, right? And the, the very wealthy kids were a little bothered that I wasn't impressed because their granddaddies had gone to that prep school. And I said, son, you started on third base. I'm so happy for you. <laughs> you started on third base. You had a great time in the home. It's great, great, great. And I love you too. But don't, <laughs> don't fool yourself. You haven't come from before first base. That You get my point. So it's looking at the whole picture. It's a great question. Okay. Thank you. Um, Doctor, before you go into front, Dr. Anderson wants to ask you. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Anderson. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, so the next question I have for you is Black soldiers of World War II were denied the GI Bill. Yep. How can we find a way to use this fact to help Black students have some assistance, uh, some financial assistance that their fathers didn't have? Yes. And what keeps white people continuing to teach 
Ooh, sorry. <laughs> Uh, to, to teach. teach or allow their children to be racist? It's such a powerful question. First of all, there were some Blacks and some women who were privileged to take advantage of the Veterans Bill, the GI Bill, but nothing like what it should have been, just as there were some who got the housing benefits, but not most, okay? Um, first of all, we, we are all the products of experiences from that childhood. I said that. When I marched with the children in Birmingham, the police commissioner, Bull Connor was his name. And he said, and at that point, uh, you you call when you were being not nice, you call people Negras. It was between Negro and the other word, Negra. And and I'm there and I'm I led this little group and we're there at City Hall. And all we, the reason we were put in jail was they would not give us a permit to to march for peaceful protest. And we're there. We all we wanted to do was march to City Hall and kneel and pray that we'd be given the right to a better education. That was it. So he looks at me and he says, what do you want, little nigra? Now, I'm a, I'm a nerdy little scared kid, right? When the fight broke out, Freeman was running the other way. The only thing I ever attacked in my life was a math problem, all right? I was not a fighter. I wasn't a lover. I was a math student. You got that? So I'm scared. I'm really scared. And I look up at him and I say, uh, sir, that's the word for sir, sir. Uh, we want to kneel and pray for better education. He, and he spat in my face. He did, and he threw me into the police wagon. And for years, I hated that man. When he died, my mother called me, and she was crying. I said, Mom, why, why are you crying about this man? He was so mean to me. Now, this time, I've got a big afro. I'm in college, right? And she said, Freeman, he was somebody's child. I grieve for him because he never learned to love. He was taught to hate. He never had the joy of knowing how special children can be. I grieve for him. And all of a sudden, my mama had me cry. I said, you're messing me up, Ma. And before I... <laughs> Him. And I'm supposed to be this macho guy with an afro, and I'm crying. Wait a minute. For Bull Connor. Wait a minute. But, you know, it was cathartic. It taught me to stop the hate. And what my parents always said was, don't hate the person. You may hate the action, but if you hate the person, it eats on the inside. That, I was blessed to get that message. A lot of people never got that message. The question is, how do we help them to get that message? On my own campus, I've had many of my white mentees to say, Doc, I've got this dark secret. What is it? My dad told me not to mix with black people because they might corrupt me. And they will say, and these are educated people sometimes. They will say, he will, do you think my dad's a bad person? No, he's got a lot to learn. You get the point. He's got a lot to learn and you can help him to grow. I said, bring him to see me. Let's just talk, okay? And then to let them know I'm not the exception, because that's the other problem. People, they get to know their one black friend. <laughs> you get what I'm saying? So what I'm saying is we've got a lot of talking to do, praying and talking rather than this, because that helps nobody. It helps nobody. So many children are suffering right now because some states refuse to allow the federal funds in for the health care. Oh, my God. Think about what that means. And so we would have discussions on our campus where there were people who felt that that was okay to not help those children. They would say, on the one hand, they were Christians. On the other hand, they weren't bothered. The children were not getting what they needed. So it took time to get people to think about those kinds of issues. We need the difficult conversations on our campus. Our theme was this. Let us find ways to learn how to agree to disagree with civility or to agree to disagree agreeably and not make it personal and allow people to say what they really think. Because if they only say what's politically correct, you never get to the heart of the person, the unexamined life. You just, the person has to be able to say what they really feel without somebody calling them a racist. So my, my approach is to say to people, let's stop using that language. I, let me say something that, will, that some of you may not like. I understand the rationale behind progressive movements and that term woke, but it seems to me that we've gotten to the point now where as soon as you use the word, people go to their corners ready to fight. So is it helping anything? It is not. You're not changing anybody. 
So when there are words that simply get people to the point where they just want to fight each other, we're not making any progress. But I can say to anybody, we need to know the truth. We need to know the hit. My great great grandfather was a Polish slave master. He took advantage of that little woman slave who was my great great grandmother. I've got that name. We got furniture in our house from the plantation. It's not a pretty picture. It is the truth, though. It is the truth. All right. He gave land to his mulatto son. This is all a part of the truth of the South. We cannot disregard that truth, but we don't want to say it to make people bitter. We will say, no, we have a way to go. The fact is that those veterans who took advantage of that education were able to help their families. We have much more work to do for people who didn't get that benefit. We've got to think that through. It's very important. Excellent question. Thank you. Uh, this next one comes from a student. Mm -hmm. uh, I am a young lady studying human biology, focusing on medicine and human health. Mm -hmm. I am from Detroit and I have adjusted into higher education with the help of Charles True Science program here at MSU. Mm -hmm. What advice do you have as young students from similar backgrounds as we become professionals? Mm -hmm. What have you unlearned as you grew in new larger environments? Mm -hmm. the, the most important thing is building community among students. What I find in many major places is um, <clears throat> that we haven't taken advantage of the strength uh, and potential of building a community of scholars, of young scholars. Not just minorities, but those who are interested in these issues of diversity, so Blacks, Latinos, some whites, but who learn how to study together. I think Americans have learned a lot from several Asian populations where that have been accustomed to doing that much more so than we have in the country. If you look at the highest achieving universities in this country in STEM, they usually have a large Asian population. There's a reason for that. Um, and I'm not being politically incorrect. Let me ask you a question. How many of you think there are many more very high achieving Chinese and Indian children than American children? Now, some people would say, how does he keep his job saying things like that? Because it makes you cringe even saying it. But it's not a politically incorrect question. It's a math question. There are 1.3 billion Indians in the world. There are 1.2 billion Chinese. It's something like that. Together, they make about 2.5 billion people. Billion, I'm saying, right? T the top 10% of any population will be extraordinary. 10% of 2.5 billion is what? Don't let me leave Michigan State saying you don't know basic math. What's 10% of 2.5 billion? Come on. 250 million. <laughs> All right. How many Americans are there? 330, 40? There are almost as many geniuses from those two countries as we have citizens. You know, we think of ourselves as being so powerful, but if you look at the highest achieving people in computer science and other places, you will see these populations. The head of NSF, the head of Carnegie Mellon, the, all of the science and tech companies out in Silicon Valley. It's amazing. What, what am I saying? I'm saying that somehow uh, we have to look at this the diversity of populations we have to understand what other people bring to the table, and we must find ways of helping people to be inspired by each other. My Black students are inspired by my students who come from other countries because there's an intensity that they have, a hunger. I say it's the kind of hunger we had from the Deep South because people didn't expect us to be as good coming from the Deep South. People always think Southerners are slow, all right? You know, and and we had to. We were taught you have to be twice as good. Got to work, you know. But that's what people bring from other countries. That has been a part of the greatness of America. And so I'm saying, what I can say to that student is, build that community of students, and it shouldn't just be all black students. My house are black and white and all races. You're here. Take advantage of this environment because you want to learn how to lead and work with people from all kinds of backgrounds. But find people who are better than you are academically. You are inspired. If you're only with people who are mediocre, then you're thinking you're really good. You know, all right? Find people who are really high achievers, who are breathtakingly good, so they can push you to be better. That's what we need. And then finally, to this young student, tell her I said this, don't let anyone else define who you are. Don't let anyone else define who you are. People look at women and people of color and they, they make assumptions. All right. I'll never forget in grad school at Illinois uh, in that first semester. And I'm the only little black kid in the class. No women, all white guys. Nobody speaks to me. 
And every time the professor in the new class would come in, he would look right at me and say, uh, uh, this is um, numerical analysis. In other words, I was in the wrong class. So by the time it happened the second time, we got to algebraic topology and he got ready to say something to that professor. I said, this is algebraic topology, right? In other words, I'm supposed to be here, all right? And I had, to, I really, I said it just like that to make the point, no, don't, don't, don't assume. Don't assume. Got, when I got my first midterm back in set theory, the professor put on my paper, A minus, you did surprisingly well. Now, I told you my mother was an English teacher. I went up to him after the class and I said, why the adverb? And he didn't know what I was talking about. Right? He said, what? what? And I pointed a word. And the advantage black people have, we don't turn red. He turned so red so fast. I had him. I had him. And he didn't know what to say. And he said, oh, it's because you're from a small school. He didn't know what school I was from. By the end of the semester, he said, I lied to you. I just had never had a black in my class. And I assumed that you couldn't do. You get my point. Now, here's the point. I could have at the midterm said, this man doesn't believe in me and forgot and, and, and literally stopped working hard, but I couldn't allow him to define me. And I bugged the blank out of him because the other little white boys were acting like they knew what was going on. They, uh -uh, they didn't know. I mean, when I got that A minus, I looked around, I'm a nosy little Southern kid. I'm seeing these white boys with C's, which is not right. I'm seeing something with C's on their papers. So I held my paper, but I said, well, I guess this was pretty obvious, right? Just so they could, uh-huh. Just to make the point, yeah, I can do something, all right. But it was, it was because I found I couldn't get students to work with me, so I went to the professors with a smile and said, "I need help. I don't understand." You get my point. So letting people know when you don't understand, and then working with people and finding people better than you—that's that's my job. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. All right. If we are about finished, I've got some, one more thing I have to do. I want everybody to stand. I've got everybody to stand. You know, in education, the more academic we are, the more poised and dignified we are when it comes to education. And the media will say education doesn't matter. And so I go around the country saying we must bring passion to the work. If we were at a football game, you feel the passion, right? We need to feel the passion about our values and our, our emphasis on academics. So I want you to repeat after me, but I want you to say it like you really mean it. So repeat after me. Thoughts, words, actions, habits, character, destiny. One more time. Thoughts, words, actions, habits, character, destiny. Now, this time, I want you to say it like you're at a football game. Ah, because you're always trying to say it loud, but you're still very dignified. Wait, wait. This time, like you really mean it. All right. Thoughts, words, actions, habits, character, destiny. Okay, now, here's your test. Watch your thoughts. They become your. Oh, and that's my last lesson. It's one in metacognition, thinking about how you think. When we do these things, whatever it is that's important, we must do them mindfully. It's one thing to have the passion, but to think about it. So this time you're getting ready for the test, right? Give me one more time to say it, and then we have the test. Thoughts, words, actions, habits, character, destiny. Okay, here we go. Watch your thoughts, they become your. Watch your words, they become your. Watch your actions, they become your. Watch your habits, they become your. Watch your character, it becomes your. And thank you all very much. Great group. Thank you. So um, we listen. I don't even know what even to say except thank you. Um, Dr. Robowski, we were so happy to include you in this year's series. Um, we have a gift for you. When I couldn't figure out how to make the technology work, we couldn't show you the print for this series this year. Oh, oh. but your gift is a print. Oh, very nice. Um, very nice. So we wanted to make sure that you had something to commemorate being on the series I'll this year. Put it in a frame. This is excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. 
So um, I want to thank Megan, our um, medical student, for fielding all of our questions. Thank you, Megan. So um, I have a couple more thank yous before we step out to our book signing. Um, there are a couple of people, um, and the timing wouldn't allow us earlier in the series to thank them, but your support of this series and certainly the community engaged events we've done today and through us throughout the rest of this February has been tremendous. And so um, our interim president, Teresa Woodruff, and our EVP for Health Sciences, Norm Beauchamp, please come to the stage so we can thank you effectively for your help this season. All right, last announcements. For those of you who have been with us, um, thank you for contributing to our book drive. Um, we are still collecting a thousand black girl books. We need 200 books. Now, one of the things that my grandmama used to tell us is that we have everything we need in this room and on the Zoom. We have 200 books left to, co to collect. So if you want to donate, you can see myself or Miss Nichelle Lawrence, who is just outside of that door um, to contribute. We want to thank Darnell Kendricks for the artwork. Thank you to all of our partners this year for all the ways that you've partnered. Our heartfelt appreciation to Uno Deuce for all of our live streaming and recording. Thank you to the Kellogg Center staff. I don't see John, but I know he's somewhere around. Um, I want to thank my team, Barbara, Terry, Connie, Pei, Ayandala, our med students, our volunteers. Thank you all for joining us. We are going to do a book signing. So um, when you see Dean Amalfitano, you just walk out of that door and come around in just a second. Um, we're going to do a book signing. And at 7 o'clock, MSUBA and BFSAA will be holding a town hall with Dr. Rabowski and interim president Dr. Teresa Woodruff in the same room. And we really are going to focus on what is required of us as a university those of us in our individual roles, our departments, our units, what is required of us to actually reach equity for our Black community by 2030. All right, so we're going to take a brief break so you all can get your pictures and your books signed, and we'll be right back here at 7. Thank you all so much. Yeah, you just made about the uh, egg the birds. Yeah, yeah. 